Hi, I'm Robin Patel, president of the American Society for Microbiology. I'm also the Elizabeth P. and Robert E. Allen Professor of Individualized Medicine, Professor of Medicine, Professor of Microbiology, and Director of the Infectious Diseases Research Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic. Back in March, I posted a session on top COVID-19 questions. A lot has changed since then. So here, I've answered some additional questions. SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19, is a respiratory virus. The primary way it's transmitted is human to human. When an infected person talks, coughs, sneezes, or simply breathes out, they release respiratory droplets into the environment. These droplets are laced with viral particles that can move on to infect others. There's been some evidence of airborne and surface transfer of SARS-CoV-2. We now understand that face masks do help control the spread of COVID-19, and they should be worn. There are several types of face masks. It's currently recommended by the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, that the general public wear cloth face masks. These masks can block viral droplets emitted when the mask wearer speaks, coughs, sneezes, or exhales. The CDC recommends that masks be worn by everyone to prevent the spread of COVID-19 by people who are infected but don't realize it, since it's estimated that there are many asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic COVID-19 cases. It's most important to wear a face mask in public settings when around people outside of your household, especially when you're indoors or in places where it's difficult to stay away from others. Be sure that your face mask covers both your mouth and nose and don't touch your face mask while wearing it. Wash your mask regularly in a washing machine and dry it in a dryer or by air drying. Healthcare workers need additional protection with a medical mask or an N95 mask depending on the situation. Symptoms of COVID-19 are varied. They include fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, and or diarrhea. Most people don't experience all of these and many people have absolutely no symptoms. Fever, dry cough, and tiredness are the most common symptoms if symptoms occur. Serious symptoms include difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, chest pain or pressure, or loss of speech or movement. Anyone experiencing trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion, inability to wake or stay awake, or bluish lips or face should seek medical attention immediately. The disease course can differ between people. Some people have no symptoms, some will get mildly ill, and others will get severely ill and even die. A well-known risk factor for severe disease is older age. In addition, people who have certain underlying diseases, such as chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, have received an organ transplant, are obese, have serious heart disease, sickle cell disease, or diabetes, for example, are at increased risk for severe illness. Although we've learned that children of all ages can become sick with COVID-19, most children don't become as sick as adults. However, in children, a multi-system inflammatory syndrome appears to be linked with COVID-19. This is a condition where different parts of the body become inflamed, including the heart, lungs, kidneys, brain, skin, eyes, or gastrointestinal organs. Children with this syndrome may have fever and various symptoms, including belly pain, vomiting, diarrhea, neck pain, rash, bloodshot eyes, or fatigue. We're still learning about this syndrome. It's estimated that about a third of people who get infected with COVID-19 will never develop symptoms, although that number may be higher or lower depending on the population and may change as we learn more about the virus. 
There's also a state called presymptomatic, meaning prior to the onset of symptoms. It's estimated that a significant fraction, more than a third of viral transmission occurs before people who will get sick develop their symptoms, that is in the presymptomatic phase. It's impossible to differentiate asymptomatic from presymptomatic people until, of course, time elapses. In both cases, the person looks and feels normal, although those who are presymptomatic will develop symptoms later. Infected people without symptoms are important sources of viral transmission. According to a study published in Science, four in five people with confirmed COVID-19 in China were likely infected by people who didn't know they were infected. Contact tracing has the power to be effective if there is widespread and quality implementation. According to a study in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, using a model based on real world social contact data from the United Kingdom, even if people only moderately physically distanced themselves, a robust contact tracing effort could reduce viral spread by two thirds and ultimately snuff out transmission. Unfortunately, the current number of contact tracers at work in the United States is well below the number required to conduct adequate and efficient contact tracing for COVID-19. Whether or not you should travel depends on how you're traveling and who you're traveling with and will be in contact with while you travel. Traveling in your own car, either by yourself or with members of your household, is safer than traveling by plane, train, or bus in terms of acquiring COVID-19. Even with physical distancing measures on an airplane, there's a risk of exposure to COVID-19 due to the sheer number of people sharing the same space. Close proximity to others in airports, train stations, and security lines also increase risk of exposure. And you should consider what you'll do when you get to your destination. We know that the virus can be transmitted from asymptomatic or presymptomatic people, so there's no easy way of knowing who might have it. Having all travelers wear a mask, properly cleaning surfaces in airports and on trains, buses, and planes, and sanitizing your hands regularly can help, of course. That said, if you're alone or with others from your household in your own car, there's little risk of acquiring COVID-19 there. It's pretty much like being at home. Traveling in a rental car or with people from outside your household is riskier than taking your own car and traveling only with your household members. There are two main kinds of tests for this virus, those that test for the virus itself and those that test for an immune response against it. The first kind is used to find out if someone is actively infected. First, a specimen is collected. This may be a nasopharyngeal swab, a nasal swab, a throat swab, or even saliva. For patients who have involvement in their lungs, lower respiratory secretions like sputum samples are tested. For some of these specimens, Studies have shown that patients may collect their own specimens instead of having a healthcare worker do so. I've noted confusion about what testing means. There's more to testing than just collecting the specimen. The actual testing for this virus and many other infectious diseases is done in clinical laboratories. SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, so most often, Highly sensitive molecular tests are used to pick up the specific RNA of this virus and not other coronaviruses. Before the outbreak, we had no tests for this virus. Initially, clinical microbiology and public health laboratories had to develop their own tests. Today, we also have tests made by companies and sold to laboratories to perform. Testing is more broadly available than it was back in March, but we continue to have supply chain shortages. Many laboratories have multiple tests in place just to make sure that at least one of them has enough supplies to be run at any given time. To test for viral RNA, there's typically a first step where RNA of the virus is extracted from the patient's specimen, a second step where that RNA is converted to DNA, and a third step where the DNA is amplified with primers that are specific to SARS-CoV-2. There can, of course, be subtle variations to this. This is not a trivial type of testing. Testing should be performed by trained laboratorians to make sure it's done correctly. Because these tests are by design quite sensitive, if quality processes are not in place where testing is performed, 
results can be falsely positive. In addition, some tests are more sensitive than others, and we've learned that not every infected person will test positive for viral RNA with a single test. Results can depend on the way the specimen is collected, the type of specimen collected, the timing of specimen collection relative to the timing of acquisition of the virus, the person's immune system, and the specific test being performed, among other factors. Antibody tests are markers of past infection with COVID-19. For example, if in the past you came in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, and then you experienced symptoms such as cough, fever, difficulty breathing, et cetera, that could have been caused by COVID-19, but if now recovered and were never tested, antibody testing could provide an indication that you were indeed infected. In this way, antibody testing is useful for epidemiologic studies to determine what percentage of a population has been previously infected. Antibody testing can also facilitate contact tracing and help identify potential convalescent plasma donors. At the current time, the American Society for Microbiology is working with the Infectious Diseases Society of America to develop guidelines around the use of serologic testing for COVID-19. A big challenge is that we don't know if infection confers protective immunity. That is, whether once you've been infected, you can become infected again. This means that people should not currently get tested to determine whether or not they are protected against COVID-19. Additionally, antibody tests should not be routinely used to diagnose acute cases of COVID-19. Our bodies need time to make antibodies. It takes a week or two before detectable SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are produced. That means that during the acute stage of infection, antibody tests are likely to be negative and can be misleading. However, there are select clinical situations where antibody testing might be used to facilitate a diagnosis. For example, if someone presents with symptoms late in a disease course and tests negative for SARS-CoV-2 RNA, antibody testing could be considered. In the United States, tests for SARS-CoV-2 have what's called an EUA. EUA stands for Emergency Use Authorization. Under Section 564 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic, or FDNC Act, in times of emergency, like the current COVID-19 pandemic, when there are no adequate, approved, and available alternatives, the FDA commissioner may allow the use of unapproved medical products or authorize unapproved uses of approved medical products to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions caused by chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threats. EUAs are based on the best available evidence at the time and remain in effect until the emergency ends or new evidence causes the authorization to be withdrawn. EUAs are not the same as FDA clearance or approval. When SARS-CoV-2 emerged in late 2019, we didn't have any diagnostic tests or treatment options at our disposal. EUAs have now been issued for a number of diagnostic tests and even candidate drugs for the treatment of COVID-19. We're continuing to learn about SARS-CoV-2 testing. As of today, June 30th, 2020, there are 94 individual EUAs for molecular diagnostic tests and 24 individual EUAs for antibody tests for SARS-CoV-2. Not all tests are equivalent. The FDA has removed some tests from the market due to poor performance, and recent evidence has caused the EUA for hydroxychloroquine to be withdrawn. EUAs do not guarantee the safety or efficacy of a particular product and are not long-term solutions. Supportive care, including oxygen supplementation and intubation and mechanical ventilation, if needed, are important treatments for severe COVID-19 infection. There's currently no specific FDA-approved treatment for COVID-19, with many candidate drugs being pushed through clinical trials. A repurposed injected antiviral drug, remdesivir, has received EUA for COVID-19 treatment. Remdesivir targets the machinery SARS-CoV-2 uses to replicate itself inside our cells. 
EIDD2801 is another antiviral drug being evaluated for SARS-CoV-2, but unlike remdesivir, is administered by mouth. It's an investigational drug. Clinical trials to evaluate its efficacy are ongoing. Dexamethasone is a corticosteroid used to treat a variety of inflammatory conditions. Data from a large multi-center randomized open-label trial in the United Kingdom has indicated that dexamethasone reduces mortality of COVID-19 in patients who require supplemental oxygen. These results, while encouraging, are preliminary and unpublished. Convalescent plasma, that is plasma harvested from people previously infected with COVID-19 is also under study. Because so many clinical trials are ongoing and new data is emerging on a regular basis, recommendations for treatment are regularly updated. The global impact of this novel virus has been significant, and so have efforts to stop it. More than 140 COVID-19 vaccines are under development worldwide. These numbers are unprecedented. Although the large number of candidate vaccines will likely increase our chance of success in finding a vaccine that is safe and effective, vaccine development is complex and vaccine trials take time. There are a variety of delivery platforms and vaccine types being evaluated for COVID-19. These include genetic vaccines, which use SARS-CoV-2 genes to provoke an immune response, protein-based vaccines, which use SARS-CoV-2 proteins to provoke an immune response, viral vector vaccines, which rely on another virus to deliver SARS-CoV-2 genetic material to our cells and provoke an immune response, and whole virus vaccines, which use a weakened or inactive form of SARS-CoV-2 to provoke an immune response. It's difficult to say at this time which vaccine is the most promising. In an effort to expedite the production of a successful COVID-19 vaccine, the United States government has developed a program called Operation Warp Speed to fund research for promising candidates. Companies such as Moderna, Biotech, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Vaxart are part of this program. For continued updates on COVID-19, make sure to visit ASM.org.